In this episode of Law Enforcement Today, why would anybody want to be a cop? Lieutenant Shea, tell them all who you are. I'm Lieutenant Ryan Shea, I've been in law enforcement for 13 years and I bring the law enforcement perspective of many of the topics we talk about on Law Enforcement Today while Kyle takes up a lot of the civilian topics. The whole idea of this platform is that the mainstream media doesn't always do the fairest job of representing law enforcement. Um, we wanted to bridge that gap between civilian and civil servants. So we bring in guests and topics from all over the country that impact both communities and we talk them out. So we see nationwide there are shortages. We see, you know, Dallas, I believe that last report was down 1,600 cops. We see this in, you know, everywhere from Texas to California to Connecticut. First of all, what's causing the shortage? You know, I don't think there's one definite reason why there's such a shortage in the amount of individuals who want to become part of law enforcement today. What I do think is, is the ones that are seeking out uh, careers in law enforcement are those that really have the heart and the passion to be a part of public safety, building communities, and enforcing the laws of the United States of America, the state that they live in, the town or city that they uh, want to be officers in. You talk about enforcing the law, and I'm probably going to put you in a little bit of an uncomfortable position here. We see across the country a sort of movement where there are politicians who are deciding to weigh into law enforcement and tell them that they can't enforce the law. So I'll use uh, Portland as an example. In Portland, you had the mayor saying, local law enforcement can't coordinate with federal law enforcement on immigration uh, in enforcement. Do you think that the more we see the mainstream media reporting on the officers being handcuffed, the less likely it is for people to say, yeah, that's a field I want to go into. Well, it, I think it's important to look at what officers do with the laws that are in place, right? It's our job to enforce the laws that are in place. We don't have a say as to what those laws are. That's for the politicians, the lawmakers to, to form those laws. It's our job to go and enforce them. So when it comes to that back and forth with the politics, Law enforcement, it's important for law enforcement to remain neutral in those situations. So as a law enforcement officer, I don't look at what the politics atmosphere is. I enforce the laws that are on the books that day. But what about the morale in departments? So we see in New York City, for example, where bad dudes will be arrested having done really bad things and the next day they're back out on the street without even a slap on the hand. That's got to be demoralizing as an officer. You know, it, it comes down to the passion that most law enforcement officers have for doing the job of enforcing public safety and making sure that their communities are, are safe. We don't look at what happens in terms of after we do our jobs on the street and take that person into custody on whatever violations of the law we're holding them on. I think it's important for us to not be frustrated by the after effects of what happens in the court system because again, it, it comes down to officers understanding that they're enforcing the laws that are on the books and they're there to better their communities. So we talk about the officers using discretion and, and discretion is out there for a reason because there are, there's an, a mission that the officers are trying to accomplish. The mission is public safety. Uh, the mission isn't to strictly enforce absolutely everything that's in place and there's a reason for that because there's the relationship between the law enforcement officers and the community they operate in. The only way that law enforcement operates is with the trust of the community. So if they operate in, in the means of doing things detrimental to that trust, they can lose their credibility in the community and, and we can have some, some detrimental effects of that. But you are part of the community too and I understand the need to be apolitical and, and unbiased, but you're also human. And I look at this from an outside perspective and I see attack after attack after attack on law enforcement. You know, we see there was a, a situation today where there was an officer who his truck was torched and they rode all over it. I'm looking at this from the outside as a civilian and I'm ripped, man. Mm -hmm. I am ripped on behalf of you guys. Mm -hmm. How do you, as a human, as a patriotic American first, how do you not look at that and get discouraged? Well, I look at that and I do things like we're doing here. Uh, we talk about these issues from the perspective of both the civilian side and the law enforcement side. And we look to bridge that gap. Now, we don't have the outside view of, of somebody coming in here being frustrated with law enforcement necessarily, but I understand that in order to better 
that relationship between law enforcement and the community. We have to talk about these issues and we have to talk about them in a place that we can discuss things openly like your frustration with the rest of them out there who decide that they don't want to respect law enforcement. Everybody has their opinion and, and it's our job to make sure that we enforce the laws and the rights of individuals. So I know that there's people out there who don't necessarily like law enforcement, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna change the way that I do my mission uh, and my mission being public safety. You know, I'm gonna shameless plug here for a second on the recruitment side of things. Uh, we just put together a, a fun video for uh, Enfield, Connecticut Police Department for doing a little recruiting, but our town out here in Manchester, Connecticut, Unbelievable police department. I love those guys. I'm sure you know a couple of them. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm sure they could use some some good cops out here as well. I think everybody, everyone out there who has any interest in law enforcement, seek out your law enforcement agency in your area and ask the questions as to what can I do to become a police officer and what can I do to better my community and, and better this nation. Another hot topic uh, going on this month is the Victims Compensation Fund and 9-11 survivors. We just lost yet another detective to a 9-11 uh, cancer, and we'd like to bring in my good friend from uh, former NYPD. Your turn, take it over from here. Thank you. Today I'm here to talk with David Shanice, retired NYPD detective. David, how are you today? Doing good, how are you? Good, so talk to me about the Victims Compensation Fund and what's been going on. Well. As everyone knows, uh, it was held up, but it's passed. Victims Compensation Fund's been uh, renewed, and uh, I guess you would say the bank account's been restocked. Um, no longer any fear of losing it, money running out, and um, for those struggling, there's, there's still some hope. So, you know, now that the funding has been solidified, talk to me about kind of where we go from here. Well, first of all, I think as, as a country, we need to work on removing every one of these filthy politicians who couldn't rise up for their nation and for all those who stood up when she was down on her knees and vote for these bills um, and, and get us what we need to move on. Um, I'd also like to, to get out to the public this doesn't mean the battle's over. This is compensation fine for those that are sick. You have a large amount of people, even civilians, that um, lived in the area um, or came down and helped us in the area for cleanup and recovery that live every day, more or less, as they, they get older. It's a nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, constantly hearing stories uh, alone, Detective Alvarez, you know, 10 years without anything, and then boom, cancer, linked to 9 11. Um, that still goes on for plenty of people. People are coming down with uh, a 9-11 diagnosis every single day. For those that worked at Ground Zero, those that worked at the pile, worked at the morgue, um, or worked at the Holland Tunnel, escorting the trucks through, getting covered with debris and dust for years after 9-11, are still waiting for that last shoe to drop, waiting for that diagnosis to pop. Um, as they see their brothers and sisters uh, and reading the stories about out of town guys who came in all dropping of this illness. So along those lines, we look at what is happening in terms of across the country and officer wellness. You know, we have this situation that has been a national discussion with uh, law enforcement all across the nation. And, and we've seen really it play out on the news. Uh, and for us, from a local, standpoint, you know, officer wellness is so important to uh, stress in an agency. And it really brings the aspect of how, how is an officer going to be taken care of both on the job and after they're done with their law enforcement career. In, in this case, it's, it was to a massive scale that, that absolutely needed to be addressed a long time ago. And how do you think other agencies can learn from this? Well, I still think even within New York City, there's a lot that needs to be learned. Um, in New York City, the way it's set up, you, you even have um, certain officers that when the time comes may or may not be covered based on locations they worked or hours they worked. Um, another dangerous scenario could be an officer, let's say, 
that joined the department in 2002 and let's say was lucky enough to have never worked at Ground Zero, period, never worked at the landfill or the cleanup, comes down with a rare form of cancer that's genetically tied to 9-11 being the studies have been done and may get denied because he's never worked in the right area. Mm -hmm. And the problem being, and the, the possible reason why he contracted you know, whatever horrible disease it may be, was he rode in an RMP, a radio motor patrol car, um, that was down at ground zero on a hot day or a cold day where that heater was blowing, the air circulator was not on, and it sucked in all that debris, and then you rode it eight hours a day, five days a week, month after month, until the city finally said, oh crap, time to get it to the, la to the landfill and crush it. Now they're coming down with these diseases and they have to worry about whether or not they're gonna be taken care of. Um, and the same, I would say, could go down with even families in these buildings. I can tell you right now, guaranteed, not all these buildings were scrubbed, not all these HVACs were scrubbed. There was no way to do it. Mm -hmm. And they certainly weren't gonna level every building. They weren't gonna crush every car. Um, families were exposed because officers, I know I many a times worked the Holland Tunnel and came home completely white ash. Went in the, especially the first few weeks, went in the, the, the washer and dryer. Um, is my family gonna be exposed? You know, who knows? So I think the reality is, is, is these departments and these cities, when it comes to something like this, first things first, get off your ass. Cut the bullshit, you're not dealing, it's not politics, it's lives. And let's do the right thing. Stop being afraid of, of, of offending people, hurting people. Stop worrying about the purse strings at this time. Let's get guys safe. Had those cars been crushed, had proper steps been taken, had they said, listen, the air's not clean, had they rushed respirators, um, even paper masks, it took me almost a week to get one down there. The outcome might have been a lot different. Uh, and long term, obviously would have saved a lot more money. So I, I think what needs to be done is they need to acknowledge that not everyone that comes down with one of these diseases is necessarily gonna be in a cookie cutter shape. It's gonna not necessarily match what they're looking at. Um, I think they need to realize that um, it's not about optics. It's not about how the city looks. It's not about how the department looks. You gotta worry first about the residents and the first responders. Lord knows when it happened, we didn't worry about the optics. We didn't worry about anything. We did what needed to be done. We took care of the people that were in there. We got them out, the kids in schools, the teachers, the hospitals that were there, the nursing homes, whatever it was, we got out everybody we could. We secured the area, we cleaned, cleaned the area up as best we could and we went in to recover who we could. Um, that needs to be mission one. Um, anyone who thinks that 9-11 is an isolated event, it's not gonna happen. We've seen time and time again, we're basically just operating right now on luck. You know, as it's been said before, they only got to get it right once. We need to get it right every single time. Luckily, it's been on our side. Yeah, and the preparation that I think that we can do, uh, learning from this, especially from the law enforcement perspective, because you're absolutely right. When something like this happens, law enforcement officers are not thinking about 20 years down the road. They're no. thinking about then and there and what they need to do to resolve the situation at hand. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I want to tell you how thankful I am that you came out to talk to me about this today. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, you know, the actions of those officers and, and everyone, the fire department, the civilians, anybody who went down there is absolutely one of the reasons why I got into law enforcement. Uh, and there's nothing more than I can say that. Is there something that we can give to our viewers as to where they can go to help if possible? You know, I think the, the best thing that viewers can do to help right now is, um, you know, obviously support your police, your, 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 your fire department and, and what, your vital city services, but politics. Um, get your head in the game when it comes to politics. Let's get rid of these people we need to get rid of to start getting the country back on track. Um, we can't do it without, without you, the public. Um, we, can't, we can't even police you without you, the public, having our back. And if you don't have our back, you can't blame us when, when shit goes wrong. Uh, you know, we're doing the best we can in a broken system. 
Um, and we really, as much as you depend on us when the wolf's at your door, I'm begging you, we need your help. We need these people out. We need these de Blasio's out. We need these AOC's out. We need these individuals not signing up on the Victims' Compensation Fund removed from office and replaced. I'm always a big fan of trying to get more cops and firefighters into local and state politics. Um, I've even helped with Congressman Higgins in his campaign, uh, Congressional Louisiana District 3. We need more of you guys to step up. So if any of you are listening and you have an interest in politics, please reach out to me uh, or, or reach out to us and, and, and let's get you moving. I know what needs to be done and we can get a committee going and get you out there. But we need true Americans, dedicated, willing to work, that know how to work, that will protect the people and its first responders running for office. You know, you, you touched right on it. We cannot do our jobs without the trust of the people. Law Absolutely. enforcement doesn't act unless there's that mutual trust. And part of that mutual trust is supporting law enforcement wherever you may reside. Uh, Dave, I want to thank you for coming out and talking no, to me today. Thank you very much. And, I appreciate uh, it. I'm sure we'll see some of you soon. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Thank uh, you very much. Absolutely. I'm going to send it over to Kyle and Ashley now. For those of you who follow the Behind the Uniform series, you may recognize Officer Ashley Smith. For those of you who don't follow it, you should probably follow her on Instagram. So welcome. Hi. What nice do you think you. of the fancy new set? I do like it. Um, and this is very important to have this in the background because I knew you were super proud of it last time. America. Yeah. So today I want to talk a little bit about sort of humanizing the men and women behind the uniforms. That's why we had you on the Behind the Uniform series. And that is something that you have done uh, very effectively, albeit in a pretty unconventional manner. So why don't you talk a little bit about your Instagram how you got there and why you think it's so important to show the behind the scenes. So my Instagram really started off as a fluke. Um, like I said in the last episode, I really got on it just to look at memes because all my friends were looking at memes and I wanted to see them. And so I, my profile picture was a baby duck for the first month and then after that I posted a fitness photo and that took off and, and then I posted my first uniform picture and that really took off and then after that I just kind of picked up the momentum, tried to figure out what my followers would like I remember waking up to thousands of people following me and calling my friend and being like, I don't understand what this is. Like, I don't know any of these people. Why are they following me? And now we're at, what, 143,000? But who's counting? But who's counting? 143.7. <laughs> um, like two and a half years later. So uh, basically what I do with my page is I show me in all aspects. I'm not out there being fake. Um, I do some photo shoots and stuff like that for my fitness and bodybuilding. But other than that, it's, I posted a video this morning about me you know, waking up and not being a morning person. I'm literally authentic, raw, and how it is. And I just show every single avenue of my life. So, I have to ask the question, because it's something that a lot of people are gonna wanna know. You get a little aggressive, how do you get away with it? And I ask that because so many different departments across the country have such different social media strategies. You have some departments that are, you can't even have a public presence or persona. You have others that are a little bit more lax about it. How do you get away with it? So first of all, I would like everyone to understand that New York State is protected by civil service if you're a full-time employee. Um, that is really without getting you know too into it is you have to do something very very bad and illegal and actually be convicted of it to ever lose your job so with that being said uh, we're behind the times in certain aspects and we're ahead in others a lot of our departments are very old school um, so they just say either they don't want to deal with it or social media is for you if it's personal it's personal then do your thing that's what it is for me and any of the posts that I have where I'm in uniform for my department, you'll see the patches and the names blurred. I actually don't even have to do that. I choose to do that because I don't know, I don't want anybody to know who I actually work for. You know, sure. I want a little bit of privacy. Yeah, are you able to probably find out? Yes. I'm the public information officer for my department. I'm on the news constantly. I am do things with media, I do things with the, um, the community, and it's all over You know, either our page or the news page, but I'm always on the news. So it's special for me because I also have a side contract, which I do that stuff. So 
it was easier for me to introduce that into my social media because I'm already a public figure when it comes to my department and being on the news. Uh, other aspects of it, if you see me in uniform and nothing's blurred out, that is a personal uniform that I have had made, patented, trademarked for myself so that I can make videos. We didn't have a social media policy until me, and now they call it the Officer Ashley Smith policy. Um, but <laughs> obviously, when I tell people, I'm like, obviously if I was violating my SOPs or my rules or regulations or my state law or civil service law, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing, right? Otherwise, I mean, I'd be getting suspended 24-7, and then I, then I would definitely lose my job. So but I'm not. From your perspective, why is it so important, whether it be introducing um, you know, some kind of a social media presence for a department, all the way to people building their own brand, why is it so important to show the behind the scenes? Because, I mean, the day that you even apply to become a police officer and you tell your friends, you know, you're already public enemy number one. And that's unfortunate because that's not how the world was. But in 2019 and even the last probably six years, that's how it is now. We are an enemy. And it was never like that before. So my whole, you know, basic goal behind this is to show people, hey, listen, okay, I chose to be a police officer 11 years ago. That's my profession. That's what I do for a living. I do that eight hours a day. Yeah, you're never off duty. Okay, well, this cop is. When I get off duty, like, I am off duty. If I have to act, of course I'll act. But otherwise, I'm a normal human being. Like, I bleed like everybody else. I get, you know, sick like everybody else. I go to the bathroom like everybody else. I eat like everybody else. I am a normal person. Just because I throw a uniform on, which is basically just as thin as this T-shirt that I have on, I'm still a human being under that. And I want everyone to see that, to be like, okay, I've seen her on social media. I know how she is. I want to approach her. I want to talk to her. And that's actually what's happened to me now. People, I had no idea how many people follow me locally. And they will literally, I'll get to a complaint, and they might have been raging and fighting and screaming and yelling. And they're like, oh, my God, I know you from social media. And it's like instant. Like, everyone is chill. You know, everyone wants to talk to me. And it's like the complaint never happened. It's like it's completely over. And if, if I can do that even to a couple people, then my job is successful. I'm going to put you on the spot. <clears throat> you made some money last year on Instagram, and you were pretty selfless about what you did with that. I, I know because I know you. Are you willing to talk a little bit about what you end up doing with that money? Sure. Um, so I do get paid to do promotions for businesses. It's no secret. You know, I'm, I'm sponsored by SteelFit, um, Black Rifle Coffee. I have a new business that I'm signing up with actually within like the next 24 hours. Um, so that's, yeah, the Instagram and all social media is the new outlet for business to go to advertise. So yes, I'm sponsored by companies. I do get paid to help, you know, promote different things. So I had a completely separate account where all of my social media money went to. And I was, you know, my rainy day fund, like whatever I'm going to do with it, I'm just going to keep it. I'm not going to live out of my means. I'm going to continue to live just on my police paycheck and that's it. And then just push all that money aside. Well, what ended up happening was my dad's pickup truck uh, broke down and he couldn't afford to get a new one. And he was just dumping money, you know, like our parents are old school, like they just keep dumping money into vehicles, like just to try to fix it rather than saving all that money and then going to buy a new one. So I knew since I was 15 years old that his dream pickup truck was an F Ford 150. So I took all of my social media money, my savings and some of my retirement and I bought him his truck. It was literally the single most best thing I've done in my entire life. Like not even being a cop, not getting my degree, nothing that was literally the single best thing I've ever done. These are the stories that you don't get to see every day. <clears throat> I think it's really easy to step back and, and maybe scroll through Instagram and see someone who's being a little bit aggressive in a, a fun way. Uh, you know, it's different than people are used to seeing in law enforcement. And I think what's so important, whether they're seeing that or they are seeing uh, someone in uniform, is that there are men and women truly behind those. And so that's, that's it for today. So. Thanks for having me. And if anyone has any rant topics, send me an email because that's like my favorite thing to do. Well, I'm glad to see there's still humor in law enforcement. I think uh, Ashley brings a unique perspective to the table and I'm glad you were able to talk with her. You know, she brings some, she brings some fire, she brings some edge, but I think she also really brings a lot of that uh, personal community involvement and gives a very different perspective. When I, when I was growing up, all of the cops that were in my family and friends, they were a little bit more rough around the edges, uh, a little bit more old school, and it's kind of cool to see a new generation of law enforcement that's really focused on how do we use social media and how do we engage the community. You know, in the beginning we talked about, you know, 
all law enforcement, we're all humans. And, and that's an aspect that we can't forget. And it's an aspect that has to come out both in the way we conduct ourselves as law enforcement officers and the way we conduct ourselves in our community and the community as a whole being law enforcement today. So guys, this is not our show, this is your show. The whole idea of bridging the gap between civilian and civil servant is done by taking on the topics that you want us to talk about. We've got guests that, as you can see, fly in from all over the country. Uh, we welcome guest appearances, we welcome your topics. As always, we're gonna leave you with the faces and the images of those officers who have been killed in the line of duty so far this year in 2019. Special thanks to Dave Bray USA for allowing us to use his song, Last Call. Thank you all for watching. Thanks for sharing. God bless America. Man down, man down, I'm bleeding out. There's no time, no time, so please hear me out. These are the last few words that I'd like to say to you all. My last call Tell my wife I love her And that I won't be home tonight Thank her for those long hot years We tried to get it right Tell her I'll be waiting That she makes it through it all This is my last call Ask her to forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. And tell her I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That I can't be. The man that she's gonna be. Where the winter meets the fall This is my last call And tell my children that I love them Oh yeah, the daddy always loved them so and tell them to hold the mother tight And to never let her go and tell them I'll always be watching My last call But tell him to fight for me Do what's right for me Choose the light for me But don't ever forget me Watching, and I'll be there when they fall. This is my last call. For those who served beside me and who held that thin blue line, stand tall, stand strong, and hold your head up high. I'm sorry.
this is my last call.